Thank you everyone for coming and joining us today for this awesome event. My name is Courtney. I'm a bookseller at Grassroots and today we have author Daniel Simpson with us for his book The Truth of Yoga and he's joined in conversation with Oregon State University professor Stuart Sarbacher. Um, Daniel teaches at the Oxford Center for Hindu Studies in teacher trainings around the UK and at Tri Yoga in London. He is a graduate of Cambridge University and has a master's degree from SOAS University of London. His book, The Truth of Yoga, is a clear, concise, and accessible handbook for the general reader that draws upon abundant research, recent scholarship. It outlines new findings with practitioners in mind, highlighting ways to keep traditions alive in the 21st century. Stuart Sarbacher is an associate professor in the School of History, Philosophy, and Religion at Oregon State University. He is the author of Tracing the Path of Yoga, the History and Philosophy of Indian Mind-Body Discipline, and The Eight Limbs of Yoga, a Handbook for Living Yoga Philosophy. Um, so the way this event is going to work is Daniel and Stuart are going to lead a conversation together for the majority of the event. And then we'll open up the floor for a Q&A from the audience for the last 15, 20 minutes. And so please use the Q&A box to um, ask a question at any point during the conversation. And we will use that Q&A to run the um, Q&A session at the end. Um, also, I'd like to let you know, I will be putting the link to buy The Truth of Yoga from Grassroots up in the chat shortly. I highly recommend you to buy it from us. Not only will you be supporting Daniel as an author, but you'll be supporting Grassroots, a small indie bookstore that also brings events like this to you. And with that, I will let Daniel and Stuart take it away. Thank you, Courtney. Yeah, thanks so much. So um, I'm going to just sort of jump in to start us up. Um, my plan is just to uh, ask Daniel some questions and see where we go with it. Um, one of the first things I wanted to say is I kind of see Daniel as a bit of a kindred spirit. Um, we both now have published books through North Point Press, which has really been one of the great sort of publishing houses at the, the sort of vanguard of a conversation between people doing the academic study of yoga and practitioners. Um, so it's happy to be sort of, you know, an uh, alumnus of that. Um, maybe we should get special jackets or, or something like that. <laughs> um, or some sort of North Point Press merch. Um, the other thing, though, is I think we both have a deep and abiding interest in kind of the larger arc of yoga's history and philosophy. And we both come out recently with books on the topic. Uh, of course, the one, uh, The Truth of Yoga, we'll be talking about today. My book similarly talks about this larger arc and um, but pitched a little bit more towards an academic audience. So I think they're quite complementary. And if you like Daniel's book, um, you know, and you want to sort of, you know, move to the next stage, maybe with a little bit more uh, kind of language focus, um, I encourage you to take a peek at that too. Um, in any case, I, I'm, I just want to say I'm really happy to be here and be part of this conversation. And I'm guessing it's one of a, among a number of future conversations that Daniel and I will have about yoga. Certainly so hope I so. The, what's that? I said I certainly hope so. Yeah, me, me too. So, um, you know, the first question I wanted to ask, and you, you touched on this briefly in the book, um, but it would be great to hear a little bit more about your background in terms of the practice of yoga and your, your studies. Um, and I'm very familiar with so as in London, which is where you did your master's degree, which is really the epicenter to some extent for global yoga studies. Um, so I'd love to hear a little bit more about the winding path that led you to this project, both personally and academically. Well, thanks, Stuart. Yeah, um, I think we do have a lot in common in terms of you know having a, a definite pra practitioner sensibility. Um, that's driving our interest in academic study. I mean, you've taken it to a much higher level than I have. I've only really sort of dipped my toe into the scholarly waters, but um, I have heard the way that you've spoken about uh, yoga history and, and philosophy. And um, I've always been impressed by, 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 by the grounding in practical questions and, and, and the relevance to, to the idea that people might actually do this sort of thing rather than be objects of uh, you know, obscure abstract interest. <laughs> and, uh, I was drawn to yoga studies kind of late, I suppose, in my practitioner life. Um, 
I originally started practicing yoga because I was unemployed and depressed <laughs> and uh, it, uh, it helped. Um, but uh, that was preceded by having been to India a few times. And mm. um, I had in India got in contact with, you know, I guess, traditional yogis, uh, modern sadhus, and mm. uh, had an awareness of this sort of otherworldly renouncer lifestyle uh, that I didn't really understand. <laughs> and uh, mm. I guess the last 20 years of my life have been a process of making sense of strange semi-naked dreadlocked characters sitting around <laughs> fires smoking hash pipes and um, somehow being connected to people in lululemon tights making shapes on mats and uh, um, as i got deeper into the practice of yoga i got more interested in trying to understand where it came from and i realized that uh, there was more of a connection than, than i'd ever understood um, and that when i turned to you know, the texts that people first point you to the yoga sutra the bhagavad gita they weren't talking about what I was doing in my weekly yoga class. <laughs> Instead, they were talking about yeah, very arcane ideas. And it took me a while to begin to understand them. And more and more, I wanted to read you know, a little bit more about the sort of missing link between mm. early yoga or, or you know, this sort of idea of stepping away from conventional existence, uh, conventional perception on one level, but even you know, societal norms. Um, and you know, at the same time, sort of something that was what we could do in a class context for 90 minutes and then go back to live in the world mm. and every time I read another text it didn't have the answer <laughs> and uh, it was only when I encountered Mark Singleton's yoga body uh, about 10 years ago that uh, I started to see that there was another way of looking at it which mm. was that what I was doing was a relatively recent offshoot of the yoga tradition and perhaps couldn't be traced back all that far mm. um, and at that time the scholarly world was was sort of I guess quite dismissive of the idea that there was a connection between modern postural practice and you know this this ancient tradition and i think that had been sort of ingrained in scholars for, for about 100 years going back to you know colonial <laughs> dismissive views of, of these weird degenerates mm -hmm. um but you know as i started probing a little deeper i realized that, 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 that there were common threads and I was really interested in trying to understand them. And I realized the only way to do that would be to go and do some formal study, just reading what I could find in translation without really any guidance, wasn't gonna take me as far as I wanted to go. And it was when I discovered that Jim Mallinson had been hired as a Sanskrit lecturer at SOAS. And I knew of Jim from my various wanderings in India and his own wow. experience hanging around with, <laughs> with uh, the, the wild men. Uh, that uh, he, you know, he knew what he was talking about from many different perspectives as a Sanskrit mm -hmm. scholar, but also as someone who'd spent a lot of time living in India. So um, I guess I wouldn't have gone into scholarship otherwise. It would have just seemed rarefied. But those two ways in Mark's uh, you know, quite um, sort of myth-busting approach to modern yoga history and, and, and you know, Jim's sort of background in, 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 in living tradition suggested, especially once you know, I realised they were working together on the Hatha Yoga project at SOAS, which you know, only happened after I got there. It's really yeah. fired me up but at the same time I've always been a practitioner so I guess the book came into being because I'd spent all this time absorbing information like a sponge and I made a few attempts to get enrolled in a PhD program and take it further academically and it just wasn't for me and mm -hmm. I realized that actually what I wanted to do was to write the book that I'd been looking for when I first started out with all these questions and trying to make you know this, this sort of abundance of new information and understanding that's, that's surfaced in the last 20 years more readily available more accessible more easy to digest and and, and more relevant to a practitioner mindset because although it's all out there these days you know you can find this material online it's 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 generally quite dense and demands a lot of prior knowledge to make sense of so it's a long and winding answer to <laughs> a long well, winding yeah, story yeah, i really appreciate that i mean one of the things i I'm, you know, that comes to mind towards the end, towards the end of, you know, what you said here is um, your work at the Oxford Center for Hindu Studies, which really is, again, a kind of interface between the sort of academic world and the, the practitioner world. And this work seems to just really dovetail with that, as well as, you know, bringing up, um, you know, Jim Mallinson's work and Mark Singleton's, um, their book, The Roots of Yoga, which came out a few years ago, really covers in a way unheard of in the history of yoga, the, the breadth of yoga literature, um, and is, you know, again, a, an essential work on the, the bookshelf of any aspiring yogi or yogini or scholar of, of yoga studies. So, I mean, from my viewpoint, it's like, 
you've studied with the best in some respects, you know, at the this this sort of epicenter of yoga studies. I mean, I think it's also worth mentioning Jason Birch, who's you know who's got a great website called The Luminescent, um, who's been doing a, you know some of the work that you're talking about, sort of connecting the dots between the kind of late medieval and early modern period to to say. Yes, there was a lot of innovation going on, but there are, were also very important links in terms of things like the development of more elaborate postural systems in the late medieval and early modern era that you know dovetail again with some of the developments of gymnastics and calisthenics that are integrated into modern yoga. So, so yeah, I think I feel even more like your kindred spirit after hearing this narrative. You know, if, if for no other reason. In my own sort of experience practicing yoga, um, I found that my academic work has really enhanced the way I've sort of thought about and understood that practice. And at the same time, I have to say my scholarly work is deeply indebted to experiences in yoga classes, in the field, and the insights into the sociodynamics of being in a yoga community. Um, there have just been so many points where I just, you know, had these sort of eureka, aha moments because of that kind of fruitful tension between being a scholar and a practitioner. Well, the other big question I really wanted to ask you is, um, you know, the, the truth of yoga is a <laughs> very bold title. Indeed, yes. You know, we, <laughs> what I wouldn't get away with on the cover of a PhD, I'm sure. <laughs> maybe, maybe not, yeah. Um, so, you know, I can't help but think like we're, we live in a historical moment in which truth is so contested in many ways. And, um, you know, so it's, it's an interesting kind of uh, juxtaposition there to be talking about the, the, the truth of yoga. Um, but, you know, I think it's one of the sort of framing concepts or ideas for the book as a whole and expresses to some extent, I think, what you're trying to do in the work. Um, I'm wondering if you can just talk a little bit more about what you mean by the truth of yoga and you know, how that is expressed or in what ways it's expressed in the text. I think, um, I mean, the first thing I should probably do is just, just read a quick caveat from, from the very first page, I think, <laughs> or maybe it's page two, <laughs> but um, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, over time, a few things became clearer as I started delving into to the history of yoga practices. Um, popular books often blur the distinctions between different systems, but there has never been any such thing as one true yoga. Uh, the practice and the theories behind it have evolved, becoming combined in a variety of ways. None of these is truer than others. Each of them makes sense in context, but there's no obligation to pick one text or one form of yoga and then critically follow whatever it says we're free to ignore what might not seem relevant, but that makes it important to know what traditional teachings say and to distinguish this from how we interpret them. So that paragraph, I think, sums up sort of all the different ways in which truth was in my mind. Um, first of all, on the most simple level, I, I spent a lot of time being frustrated by the way the modern yoga world is saturated with you know, new age candy floss <laughs> and uh, mm -hmm. swimming around and it can get quite sticky and uh, quite sickly. And uh, I, I, I really wanted to, to, given my own immersion in, in, in India, effectively, but also in, 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 in yeah, serious consideration of, of the lineages from which modern yoga has evolved, um, to do some justice to that and say, well, this is actually what is the yoga tradition as opposed to you know, the Theosophical Society or whatever else. Um, or you know the the, the secret or, or, or any any number of new age uh, spirituality books. Um, so my working title um, was actually yoga without the bullshit, and um, it was an attempt to sort of say what's yoga here, and you know, never mind all this extraneous stuff. So that was the first level of it. The second one was, I mean, you know, it was a little bit sort of one in the eye to, 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 to the scholarship, I suppose, because I read Roots of Yoga, and it's a fantastic book. It's a wonderful resource. Um, Two things that struck me about it, I kept recommending it to yoga teachers or to my students at the Oxford Centre for Hindu Studies, and they found it really hard to read. Mm. <laughs> and uh, that's because it's very dense and it packs such a variety of sources in there. 
that it becomes very difficult to navigate your way around. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to say that although they've tried to emphasize the plurality of yoga traditions, and the MA I took had the title Traditions of Yoga and Meditation, it seems, you know, it's, it's, it's almost impossible these days, <laughs> sort of many years after post-structuralism and all manner of other intellectual currents to assert any such thing as there being truth. <laughs> um, there are only discourses competing with each other. Um, but uh, I felt like in Roots of Yoga, there clearly were common threads uh, and, and there are you know, themes that recur and recur, all right? They get you know, branched off in slightly different directions. But the fact that yoga has kept changing and the fact that there are many different expressions of, of, of what yoga can be and, and has become over the centuries mm. does not mean that there aren't you know sort of shared ideas that we can see again and again and again um, and also uh, it doesn't mean that it needs to be made so complicated that, that it's all yeah you, you need this sort of enormous mind map to locate 120 texts on um, we could you know, break it down into a few simpler steps of there's this phase, there's that phase, there's this theme, there's, there's that influence. Uh, and you know, that's what led to this collection of 100, 500 word chapters <laughs> that, that sort of say, here are the building blocks of all the things that have been called yoga ever since the beginning of time up until right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, to say, you know, there isn't really necessarily the absolute truth of everything in any of them, but all of them have been, you know, the essence of a very true expression of something that is yoga at one time or another. And we in the 21st century engaging with traditions of yoga are bound to do our own little remix and, and you know, make something alive for us right now. Um, so it's really helpful to, to, to understand the difference between that process and the original underlying sources. Um, and also to then realize that at every stage through yoga history, there's been this creative rearranging going on. Um, and that can be done respectfully and you know, in keeping with tradition. We can have our own relationship with the past while moving forwards in new directions. And so that's what I really wanted to bring forth and suggest that people do, but do it overtly, consciously. Don't do what you know, the older generation of very influential teachers did from Krishnamacharya onwards saying, I've not invented anything while <laughs> sticking loads of new things into the mix. Uh, yeah, so, well, and, and I was gonna say, what you're saying reminds me of, um, something Gavin Flood, who is a, a very sort of well-known scholar of, of Hinduism, has argued that there's a danger in looking at any sort of historical arc of tradition. And he speaks specifically to Hinduism and kind of see everything that came before as somehow a piece of what is now, as opposed to seeing those traditions as complete in their own way within each historical moment. And I think you're articulating a, a sort of a, a kind of version of that with respect to yoga that there is adaptation at every stage, um, but every stage is its own unique adaptation in a way as well. So we should be hesitant to just say where we are now is somehow culmination of everything that came before, as opposed to looking at those distinct eras of the development of yoga as being developed to fit you know, the context in which it came out of. Absolutely, you summed that up really well. And I think the other thing as well is to, to bear in mind, you know, there's a tendency now to sort of get very self-critical and to assume that it's all somehow debased uh, and there's some you know, ancient pure yoga from which it's all descended and been corrupted and, and that actually we're all sort of uh, mis misguided cultural appropriators, commoditizing and bastardizing right, left and center. And, and uh, you know, that's just not true or it doesn't need to be. I mean, and at the same time, we can't just sort of say, well, you can call anything yoga if you feel like it, because yeah, there, there is some limits to, to the elasticity of this term. That's and, uh, a great point. And then it seems like there's a real spectrum there between kind of asserting, on one hand, a kind of timeless ancient yoga that's unchanging and the anything goes, you know, kind of approach to yoga. And, you know, uh, you know, as in many things, the truth is probably right somewhere in between those sorts of extreme positions. You know, I, one sort of interesting example, you know, that might be worth sharing on my part is a couple of years ago, I was doing some research at the Krishnamacharya Yoga Mandiram, which is associated with this teacher Krishnamacharya who you describe in your book. And I was talking with one of the faculty there about you know, how they felt about some of these issues about appropriation. 
you know, adapting, you know, contemporary cultural and spiritual practices, um, and especially issues that kind of tie into Indian culture and identity. And she told me, you know, I don't mind when, you know, students come to India and, you know, who are sort of Anglo-American and they wear saris. You know, to me, that's their way of sort of respectfully trying to kind of acculturate themselves to the environment. But when they wear a bikini with Krishna on it, this is a different story. This is, you know, disrespectful. And I thought that was a great kind of, you know, middle of the road way of looking at things. Like on one hand, a certain sort of adoption of cultural behavior or other things, you know, is respectful and part of the picture, but there are limits to that. It's like, I can't remember the exact uh, historical context for this quote, it's a little late in the evening, my brain's not firing properly, but I remember there was some court <laughs> case around censorship in the UK, it might even have been the, the, the trial related to Lady Chatterley's lover, um, but uh, maybe something completely different, but I remember a judge saying words to the effect of uh, when asked to define pornography, uh, I know it when I see it, <laughs> and I think, I think this is similar with, with yoga. Um, any attempt to start policing everybody else and saying this is or that is or isn't yoga is is just fraught with misery for everybody concerned. Um, but I think we should all be asking ourselves very clearly, you know, the same question: you know, is this in keeping with a respectful relationship with tradition? If not, why are we calling it yoga? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. what, what 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 are we using that term for if it's not just for marketing purposes? <laughs> unless we've got some foot in. In, in one of these camps that have previously been associated with that word. Uh, it's, uh, so that's, that's the question I, I come up with. And it's really our own responsibility and I'm not gonna go around and try and shut anyone down. But um, I do think we should ask those questions if we, if, if, if we care about having any connection to the past. And if we don't, I do question whether yoga is the correct term for it. Yeah, well, and, and again, that perhaps, you know, brings us back to the sort of the truth of yoga of, you know, kind of taking a critical eye and, you know, maybe developing some historical consciousness. You know, one of the things you talk about in the book, you know, which is, I think, really come to a head in the past few years are some of the cases of abuse leveled at particularly high prominent gurus and teachers. Um, you know, I can't help but think, you know, part of what you're saying in this book is some historical and critical consciousness here might help us navigate these situations or in some cases avoid them um am i on the mark there i mean I oh absolutely yeah yeah i mean i think i think to a certain extent this book has only been possible for me to write because i no longer really identify with any particular tradition of teaching i i started out as a, as a good ienga yoga student um i met mr ienga a couple of times uh once accompanied on I'm on a trip to China and uh, at the time went, went and studied in Pune and uh, I don't know I mean that was a, it, it has its uh, it has its wonderful gifts to the world Iyengar yoga but having seen the Iyengar family in action in situ I learned a lot about why it's taught in the way that it is <laughs> due to the interpersonal dynamics of the particular individuals concerned mm -hmm. uh, he's yeah you know, he was a fiery man with with quite a temper um, and uh you know, I've seen I've seen up close in other situations as well, other schools of yoga with their, their various, you know, sort of uh, dirty laundry that nobody likes to air in public. <laughs> um, and it's all sort of bubbled up, as you say, in recent years. There's almost no school of yoga that doesn't have a, uh, if it's not a sex scandal, it's uh, it's, it's uh, some other abuse of, of power and authority that's, uh, that's come to light. Money. Uh, yeah, money also, yeah, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, th I think then, you know, in the end, we have to question why we, um, invest human beings with some enormous power over us except in terms of having respect for, for their knowledge and their ability to transmit it. Taking it beyond that uh, is, 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 is complicated but the problem is that yoga is <laughs> descending from a tradition in which that's exactly what was required of you. Um, you know, right service of the guru in one form or another was very strongly promoted in many of the lineages that have brought this to us. Um, so I think you know we have to we have we have to realise that, that that most of us who are engaging with this tradition now are, are globalised. Even people in India are, are now looking at the the tradition of yoga from a globalised perspective, um, and, and and therefore those those mechanisms may no longer apply. They may not be the best way of ensuring that the the objectives we're seeking are met. Um, 
and I think that really leads to the core of the question about modern yoga is you know, mm. what are our goals? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the traditional goals of yoga in terms of, 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 of liberation from the cycle of births or you know, the accumulation of supernatural powers mm. uh, are beyond most of us and beyond most people's interest, I think, as well. So as soon as we start reframing and redefining things, many, many things come up for reconsideration. And um, speaking for myself, I've always had a strong anti-authoritarian side um, mm -hmm. for, I've abandoned various careers as a result of this <laughs> over my time, particularly as a foreign correspondent uh, radicalized by working for a newspaper that, that printed some of the most egregious lies about weapons of mass destruction in Saddam Hussein's Iraq, enabling the, the 2003 mm -hmm. invasion. Um, so it's always made me quite skeptical of uh, the construction of, uh, of narratives that support hierarchies. Um, and I think you know, yoga is best served when we understand that the, you know, the real search is, is internal and anybody else can only be a catalyst for, the, for, for, for that to take place. A teacher is a great teacher if they try to remove your dependence on them. Um, if, 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 if it's working any other way, I, I want to run a hundred miles in the other direction. Um, and I think really what I was trying to emphasize is that you know, the tradition of yoga has always been about this internal inquiry. So whatever the role of submission to the teacher or ultimately surrender to something bigger than ourselves, um, that needn't you know, preclude setting strong boundaries. <laughs> it's quite possible yeah. to do the two that, things in that's, parallel. That's a great point. And, and I think you, you emphasize that towards the end of the book, again, that you know, part of this is about institutions and individuals and their behavior. Part of it is about sort of educating ourselves and setting appropriate boundaries. You know, one of the things that I've noticed that really kind of represents a transformation in often in the wake of these, you know, scandals and other situations is a shift from this kind of the model of the kind of unlimited authority and power of the guru to a kind of more, you know, flattened institutional structure. Like what you see in Kripalu here in the United States, for example, which, you know, had a sort of a falling out with their guru and ultimately chose to keep going, but through a kind of institutional model. Now it's one of the, you know, one of the greatest hubs for both, you know, teaching modern yoga and doing scientific research on it. And again, I, I'm not super familiar with Kripalu and don't know the interworkings that well, but from, from what I've seen, that's at least one example of a shift from the sort of charismatic guru model over to a kind of institutional structure that at least in principle, doesn't invest that sort of power and authority in any given individual. I've heard that example cited as well. And again, I'm not personally very familiar with it, but it, you know, it does that, that does sound like a, a shift in a good direction to, to you know, not centralize authority in one human being because humans are generally flawed um, and uh, given the opportunity, we'll, we'll demonstrate this. Um, so if, if the checks and balances exist, that's all very helpful. But there's one thing I do want to emphasize. I, I feel like there's been a, a shift in a not necessarily always very helpful direction around uh, how to respond to these, uh, these problems. Um, and it's there in the broader culture. It's not just a yoga thing, but the idea that somehow we can construct uh, some sort of uh, safe space in which no abuse could ever take place again. Um, and, and, and that's not possible unless we live in prison. Um, so I think I think we have to acknowledge also the need for you know, autonomy and agency you know, requiring us to actively be defining boundaries ourselves and that therefore part of the education process is empowering ourselves and each other to do that. Um, and sometimes it's suggested that that's almost, you know, to be blaming the victims or to mm -hmm. somehow be shifting the focus away from the abusers and the need to set up you know, structures whereby nobody can do anything ever again. And I, I was thinking of this more in context of, you know, some of the more banal things like whether or not teachers should touch their students and, and mm -hmm. give them tips on how to arrange their bodies in postures. Um, but, you know, take that too far to the to, 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 to logical extreme and it's, it's in the realm of there's really actually nothing you should ever teach anybody. You should just invite them into a room and make whatever shape they feel like and hope it feels good. Um, in which case, yeah. why have a teacher? There's always an imbalance of power in a teaching relationship. And it can only be a healthy balance of power if you don't give all your power away as a student or expect that somebody else is going to come along and stop you from having to, to manage your own power boundary. 
you know, I was going to say on that front, you know, years ago when I was doing some formal teacher training to get certification to teach myself, we had a lot of conversations about the hands-on adjustments. And I remember one of my sort of fellow students was actually a trained therapist who had gotten a sort of special license in like massage therapy. So she felt like she had some sort of, you know, credential to touch other people. And I think coming out of her, her therapeutic training, she felt that, you know, part of the, the virtue or value of a yoga class was in fact the physical contact that happened and that real sort of human touch, which could be a very healing and powerful thing. On the other hand, you know, we've all, you know, been, you know, become aware of, you know, the extremes to which touch can go, you know, in terms of both sexual abuse and, you know, physically harming. You know, I, you know, practiced Ashtanga for many years, which, you know, in a very traditional way, which includes a lot of very aggressive adjustments to get you deeper into poses. Um, and, you know, it's kind of one of those things where maybe you progress a little bit more quickly, but you may pay a price. Um, and actually there's a film, Ashtanga New York, where w the actor Willem Dafoe talks about getting an adjustment where he says there's sort of this mixture of fear and then you sort of have to surrender because, you know, this is going to be very intense, very powerful adjustment. And if your body's not ready, it, you know, it could be a problem. But again, I think, you know, Ashtanga Vinyasa practitioners often progress really quickly in part because of those very forceful active assists. Um, and it, so, it, you know, again, goes goes back to a whole number of issues about personal responsibility. You know, one of, uh, you know, uh, Kevin Kimple, you know, my co-author in the yoga handbook, uh, yoga philosophy handbook, like to say, you know, in India, there's no liability culture. So if you go to a class and the teacher, you know, twists your arm and hurts you, it's sort of like your responsibility. Whereas in the U.S., there's much more of an idea that the teachers have a responsibility. And so one of the ways this is manifesting is, you know, teachers not asking students if they have physical issues before the class because they don't want to know, mm -hmm. they don't want to have the liability and a, hesi a hesitancy to do any sort of physical adjustments, you know, due to, you know, the potential for sort of, you know, it coming back in some negative way. I think that's a healthy corrective to a certain extent to to to, to be wary because I mean there, there certainly are examples I'm certainly not going to name any names but uh, of, of you know, prominent uh, American yoga teachers who who adopted that sort of uh, Indian mentality of you know I I, I know best for your body and mm -hmm. have you know, given people serious injuries and and the students have then internalised it as you know it, it was just part of the process. Um, I should have I should have done something differently, but I didn't know how. And it's similar to to, to people who've been uh, unfortunate enough to be abused, um, it's very hard to 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 stand up and, uh, and draw a boundary. And, and so, just to to sort of you know, insert a caveat to what I was saying earlier, I'm not trying to suggest that that all responsibility should rest on on others to 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 just sort of uh, somehow stop abusers from going around abusing people, but. Mm -hmm. um, that, 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 that it does it does it does take development of, of, of a new mentality on both sides and the empowering of one at the expense of the over empowering of the other and i think i think teachers have inherited a certain from the way that they were taught you know, mentality of, of knowing better than their students and mm. i've seen at the same time you know you've mentioned ashtanga in, in that world there seems to be less of a problem when you have a sincere, uh, caring teacher <laughs> taking time to have personal relationships with students on a day-to-day -day basis. And they enter that Willem Dafoe danger zone, you know, knowingly, consciously, with, almost with their sort of danger signal worked out. And, and uh, it's, mm. it's, a, it's a consensual process. Um, and I guess, you know, sometimes I wondered in the last few years whether, whether there was almost an attempt to stamp that out as illegal, <laughs> whereas, you know, mm -hmm. by, by, by the same token that consenting adults can do what they like in the bedroom, um, uh, they can do what they like in the yoga shala, but it needs to be, you know, consenting adults in, in, in a, a very managed, open way. And if the teachers don't even acknowledge that they need to change, and clearly there's a problem. So, so it is good, I think, that, that there has been that shift. The pendulum's probably swung a bit too far one way, and hopefully it will come back to the centre.
Yeah, well, I was going to say one of the things, you know, I've been talking about yoga teachers with are things like cards you can put in front of your mat to indicate mm. whether you want hands-on adjustments or other ways to sort of, you know, express in a in a way that does not put a kind of pressure on you to be the exception. Rather, this is normal. This is it is normal to communicate your preferences. There's no pressure to take an adjustment that you don't want to receive or aren't comfortable receiving. And some of that comes down to the teacher walking into the room, just making that clear, saying, you know, hello, everybody. You know, I, I, I don't wish to invade your space. I only wish to be doing something that you would like me to do. Therefore, you know, if you if you take advantage of this means of communicating with me, everything's fine. And, and there's a lot of teachers who would find that, you know, certainly five years ago, absolutely horrifying and would never want to go there. Whereas hopefully now more of them would see that as, you know, just, just another thing that you can say, like, you know, has anyone got any injuries today? <laughs> You know, I had one uh, a, a friend and you know, co sort of uh, a friend and someone who I know quite well through various yoga circles take a class with a very prominent teacher who said right at the beginning, I'm going to be doing hands on adjustments. If you don't want them, you're free to go now. <laughs> I feel ambivalent about that because, on one hand, you know, if that's that teacher's approach and it's non negotiable, then that teacher is giving you the out. On the other hand, it does represent a certain inflexibility, and you know. So it's an excellent example that one. There is no right or wrong there. I see your point, and I, I, in some ways, I have I have you know similar kind of respect for for the clarity involved, at least as an open declaration. But I think the problem, which is the sort of other side of it, the student mentality side, nobody deep down wants to be the person who says I've got a problem with that uh, That's right. maybe some are strong enough to do it but it takes it takes real clarity of vision strength of character to say yeah that's not sorry uh, not up for that bye <laughs> I'm yeah, leaving now was, and so, potentially be abused on your way out the door which is yeah, what happens you, sometimes. You need something to communicate well in advance so that people don't sign up you exactly, know, exactly, you know, first exactly, that exactly. Too, you know, because it's that moment being on the spot in front of everybody else. That's yeah. where everything goes. Woo, we have fight yeah. or flight. Yeah. So um, I want to give us make sure we have enough time for a question. I want to just ask you one more question before we turn towards the audience, which is, you know, we've been talking a lot about the need to be critical. And we've been talking a lot about some of the emergent problems that the yoga community is struggling with. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, I, when I read your book, I don't hear a, you know, we need to get out of this or this is problematic. You know, I see someone who is committed on a certain level to a yoga practice, but in a kind of critical way. You know, what would you say are the reasons why yoga might be something people want to take up right now or something they may want to deepen if they're already practicing at this sort of historical moment in our current climate. Can you, can you speak to that a yeah. little bit? Yoga helps. I mean, this year has really challenged me to be very clear about why, I think. Um, I've taught online a lot since the start of the pandemic. Um, I've done things that I've, you know, I guess, uh, never thought of doing before. I've got out of my comfort zone and I've hosted some online retreats a couple of times for the Oxford Centre for Hindu Studies, taking them out of their comfort zone. They, you know, they're normally trying to keep it a little more scholarly, like the event that we were contributing to uh, together at the end mm -hmm. of last year. Um, but we were basically, you know, offering a, a space for people to come together for the weekend and, and you know, look at teachings from the perspective of how can they help us to heal in this time of, you know, great suffering. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, that is as well as these sort of you know ultimately transcendent and sometimes even world denying philosophies of extreme practice uh, the basic message the basic algorithm of yoga is you know there is the problem of suffering uh, we need not endure it uh, there's an alternative we can understand who we are and how experience affects us in a way that is uh, much subtler than is this a threat to me um, ultimately, you know, we're going to die. There's no way away from that. And, and yoga is you know, immediately helping us to let go of our fear of what we're ultimately going to have to lose and be able, therefore, to stand with all the stuff right now that's not going the way that we'd like it to a little less agitatedly. <laughs> and uh, this year has really brought that to the fore again and again and again. And 
I found, you know, myself having to you know, put aside a lot of the things I normally want to talk about, the intricacies of what fits together in what way and, you know, which texts are more interesting than others for what reason or critical analysis of what you know, does or doesn't <laughs> you know, come from, from which place in yoga history and just say, what, what, what of all of this sort of collection of teachings is useful to us right now? And there's a hell of a lot out there. And uh, I think um, it's all very easy to... to, to the word critical is valued in scholarly circles. I mean, your entire engagement with the tradition has to be sort of motivated by picking things to pieces to a certain extent, or it doesn't get classed as scholarship. Um, and what I've really always wanted to do, although I've got that tendency in me, I was a journalist, uh, I made a career out of it, but uh, I, I wanted with yoga to try and construct rather than deconstruct or destroy <laughs> um, you know, visions that are compelling and helpful to people and, 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 and to, to, in my own personal practice, explore them, in my own you know, just teaching of yoga rather than you know, the ideas of yoga, make them accessible. Um, and then through writing this book to show over time that there, that there is a lot that's very rich in the traditions of yoga uh, that we can you know, draw on right now. Uh, mm -hmm. But the thing that we need to be mindful of is that sometimes those things were packaged in ways that you know, make them about something else that we're not so up for these days. So mm. increasingly important to just be clear about that and to say, this is a tool that is useful um, and I'm going to do something with it now. And that's potentially in keeping with the tradition of yoga. But it's not what Patanjali said or it's not you know, the teachings of Krishna. Um, because those things have a particular context and meaning that isn't necessarily relevant today. And it's often the case that yoga teachers will like to give a little line of philosophy in their classes and the texts that so many of them turn to is the Yoga Sutras. And it seems to me this least connected text to modern postural yoga practice. And yet at the same time, it's got some wonderful tools. It's, it's, it's the essence of, of why practicing asana is helpful. Um, concentrate on an object until you get really good at it and then you won't even need an object, is what Patanjali is saying effectively. Get absorbed in your postural practice, your mind becomes one-pointed. It becomes much easier to see clearly all this stuff that I'm identifying with, all this grasping after things that I want, all of this aversion to the stuff I don't like. It's irrelevant. All that does is distract me from being clear about who I am. And yeah, we can, we, can, we can access that through postural yoga. So there are these connections. And I guess what I've tried to do in my book is to show both that there are the connections and also that there's a need somehow to reassess, to reappraise, to mix our own cocktail in a way from all of these different drinks on the shelf, to, if you'll pardon the, the beer yoga metaphor. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Thank you, guys. That was such a great conversation. Super fun to listen to. Um, we do have some questions, so I'm going to go ahead and read those. Um, the first question is from Vishal, and they want to know, what value is the scholarship of yoga in ascertaining the truth of yoga? Wow. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> um, I think, you know, different approaches have different functions and um, I personally wouldn't go to a scholarly book about yoga for guidance on how to practice yoga I might be informed by that scholarly book you know, to be better uh, discerning in where I would go looking in yoga texts for guidance on practice but scholars aren't trying to guide practitioners in the practice of yoga. They're, they're, they're trying to establish a different sort of truth um, about the internal coherence of, 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 a, of a source, about its relationship to other sources, about the grand narratives of how things fit together, um, uh, about, about the interrelationship of all of this stuff with people in the world right now. But it's not from that same perspective of, of being a yoga teacher, trying to help people face the problem of suffering. That's not what yoga scholars do, um, and, 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 and nor should they. It's a different thing. I'd be as alarmed uh, if they were doing that as I would be if I went to a yoga class paid for 90 minutes of, of asana and somebody came and just deconstructed the whole idea of the project and suggested that we should leave the room because it was you know, not a thing to be doing. Um, and, and both of those things can have their place, but, but they're, 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 they are fundamentally at odds in, in that sense. So I think the challenge is, as, as somebody who, I mean, I'm sort of more on the practitioner side, I'm not really a scholar, but I've, I've 
dabbled in scholarship and I understand what it's about. And uh, I draw very much on the work of scholars. I could not have written this book were it not for all of the, 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 the research that's been done. And, and from, 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 from what Stuart's been, been saying about his new book, uh, Tracing the Path of Yoga, it's, it's the scholarly version of the same thing. It's mm. you know, a kind of distillation of all of this you know, sort of accumulation of knowledge into a manageable you know, one volume summary, but at the same time with all these branches that you can explore and with the scholarly approach, that's much more um, overt. With my book, you could read it from cover to cover almost if you didn't read the bits at the back and, 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 and just think it was you know, my words. And it's not, um, there's, there's 50 pages at the end explaining how this is heavily dependent on other people's work. Uh, and there are all the references there. Uh, so I, you know, I, 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 think, I think scholars do the world a great service because they bring this information out for us. They, they translate texts, they identify texts in the first place, they tell us what they mean, they tell us how they fit together, they tell us you know, ultimately the, the, the reasons why we've got access to this information because stuff has survived and come down to us. And all of that's wonderful, but it's, it's, it's still only the context in a way for why we do what we do rather than the how to. No, and I was going to say, you know, another aspect of this is, you know, yoga is a really important part of, you know, the history, the philosophy, the religion um, of the, you know, of India, of South Asia more broadly. So scholar, you know, one of the interests from a scholarly perspective is just simply, if we want to understand the history of religions in South Asia, understanding yoga is a kind of critical part of it it also points to larger comparative issues about things like contemplative practice, you know, practices of self-discipline like asceticism. Um, there's a lot to draw on from a scholarly perspective, but I think both Daniel and I would agree that as much as a scholarly presentation of the history of yoga isn't necessarily going to enhance your asana practice, for example, it is going to provide you a kind of background knowledge about the teachers and lineages about the greater sort of context of yoga philosophy. And as I think Daniel was really intimating, you know, towards the end of our talk, um, that yoga really asked some profound and fundamental questions about the nature of the human condition. And I think, you know, that's one place where I think the practitioner and scholarly worlds really intersect in terms of, you know, what questions is yoga trying to answer? You know, what is the practice of yoga trying to do in terms of, as I think Daniel put it, reducing suffering, but also potentially enhancing our experience as human beings. So I think there's some real common ground there. I think too, you know, ha having an understanding of some of these, you know, I think someone who's read Daniel's book would I think be, you know, perhaps a little less naive going into some of these uh, situations in which there are these active kind of guru disciple relationships um, and maybe a little bit more have some tools to be a little bit more self-aware. I think you've made an excellent point there Stuart. I was perhaps a little too scathing about scholars and, and their engagement practice because part of the process of scholarship as you rightly say is to be clear about what practice is and, and why it's undertaken and what its uh, potential benefits are whether or not the scholars themselves have engaged in it uh, and perhaps therefore we might question their, their, their presentation of it sometimes because there are some things are said that <laughs> don't seem to ring true from a practical perspective. They're almost just uh, for intellectual argument's sake, but at the same time, all of that matters. And so much is said that there is, I wrote this book for the reason that you know, Roots of Yoga exists. It's a great, it's a great reference book, um, but too few people are going to read it and it's not going to have the impact that I hoped it would have, which would be that nobody would be able to sell half of what's on the yoga shelf in a bookstore ever again because <laughs> it's, it's just got nothing to do with yoga it's just it's you know, pop, popular self-help mythology um, and uh, that's all very well but is, is, is it related to yoga and and um, so I wanted to try and say well here, here is what what does come from the yoga tradition and and then and, and we can establish it and I've learned that from yoga scholars I haven't learned that from yoga teachers I've learned that from people asking critical questions about what yoga teachers say and I think it's very important to do that um, and I think that's, that's ultimately where you know, the worldviews do intersect. Um, and I guess the only difference I sometimes see is that you know, from the practitioner perspective, it's taken as read that the fruit of this should be, you know, the flowering of more beneficial practice. Whereas sometimes from the scholarly perspective, that's, you know, 
who cares? <laughs> uh, knowledge for its own sake is, is, the, is the, the, the real guiding star. Awesome. Um, all right, we have another question. Everyone you both have mentioned is a man. What is the role of women in the part of yoga world you both inhibit? Well, it's an excellent question. I mean, modern yoga world is full of women, obviously. Um, female practitioners outnumber men in pretty much every class I've ever sat foot in, set, set foot in. Um, and there are probably you know, more, 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 more women teaching yoga as well these days. But uh, the most influential gurus in the transmission of yoga over the centuries, um, certainly even in the modern era, have been met uh, until very recently. This has been a shift since yoga globalized. Um, and until that point, uh, it's, it's, I mean, there's a fa fantastic, it's not fantastic in the sense that it's depressing, but <laughs> it's a revealing uh, note in the introduction to chapter two of, of Roots of Yoga, which talks about female practitioners and the fact that there just isn't any evidence for them. Texts on yoga are written from the point of view of male practitioners. It can therefore be difficult to assess to what extent women have practiced yoga in traditional cost contexts. There are no pre-modern depictions of women practicing yogic postures. Uh, there's just a few references to female ascetics. That's really all you find in yoga texts. You go to the Hatha Pradipika talking physical yoga in the uh, mainstream way in the 15th century. And it's all about where to put your foot in relation to your scrotum. Um, so I teach this stuff on teacher trainings where there's me talking to you know, three dozen women and they're all saying, what is this? Um, and it's an issue. And, and I think it's, 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 it's a really interesting question. And thankfully, there are now, as well as female teachers, female yoga scholars who are really grappling with this. And uh, I think um, you know, right now, at this moment, this conversation is becoming much richer. And five, 10 years down the line, there will be books that put it into context. But one thing that's become a lot clearer in, in recent years is, is the influence of women on the development of, of modern postural yoga. Uh, particularly Western women. And there's an intersection of traditional Indian yoga with um, what's sometimes been referred to as harmonic gymnastics, um, indigenously Western approaches to mind, body, spirit, integrative practices, uh, doing things that, 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 that encourage this sort of integration of uh, you know, a sort of holistic understanding of one's place in the cosmos. Um, and, and, and women brought that forward. Uh, women influenced Indian yoga teachers with their presentations of these ideas. The idea of starting a class in a seated relaxed position and ending it lying down in Shavasana probably comes from there. Um, and uh, there has been this, this consistent flow of ideas in both directions. So modern yoga, I think, has got a lot more of uh, it, it's a demonstrable connection to, 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 to the influence of women. But before that, it's very hard to identify the same the same trend. No, I, Stuart you perhaps can say more. Well, if you don't mind me jumping in, I, you know, <clears throat> I might soften, in my opinion, that assertion in Roots, uh, Roots of Yoga, in part because in the Mahabharata, for example, I think you have many examples of female, at least ascetics, if not yogis, mm -hmm. who exhibit the sorts of capacities and, you know, wisdom that you know are characteristic of their male counterparts. In general, I think you know you have a Sanskritic literature which is kind of high class male dominated. So it's perhaps not surprising that female figures are marginalized, but it might be a representation of a larger social context in which um, women's ascetic or yogic practice was often associated with the household, uh, what's called the pati vrata or the, the vow of the husband where a woman undergoes yogic like discipline, but as a way to ensure the welfare of their family in a kind of, you know, quasi magical way. But there are clear examples. Um, and especially when you get into the medieval era um, and start talking about Tantra, mm -hmm. some of the texts do hint at the important role of women as initiating figures. I mean, in some cases, they're still marginalized. But in other cases, they take on very sort of profound roles as initiators into um, tantric practice. You know, there's a class of deities called yoginis who are said in some cases to um, uh, possess female ritualists. Um, and, you know, this is perhaps, you know, part of a larger Indic tradition where you have parallel traditions of female possession ritualism, and this is positive possession, the idea that you want a good spirit to enter into you and you become a sort of vehicle for communicating to them. 
that may well go back into antiquity. So I think in the pre-modern era, there is some interesting evidence, and I talk about this in my book, to suggest that there were these parallel traditions of women's asceticism and women's tantric practice, which you know may not be fully reflected in this you know male-dominated literary sort of world. The other thing, though, um, along with what Daniel was saying about the modern era, there's a book by Elliot Goldberg called *The Path of Modern Yoga*. He's got a great couple, I think two or three chapters on Louise Morgan, who is a really key figure in popularizing the Surya Namaskar or sun salutation, which has become such a critical element of so many traditions of modern yoga. And she almost single-handedly transformed it from this sort of Indian sort of physical culture into a physical culture for women, um, particularly a kind of middle-class female demographic that was interested in you know, getting the sort of strength and skill, but also beauty, et cetera, um, through these practices. It reads like a yoga journal article, doesn't it? Her book <laughs> in that way, it's sort of- Yeah, yeah exactly. She talks about using a, a, uh, uh, using a piece of rubber if you have a linoleum floor, which may be one of the threads that came together as the origin of the yoga mat. Um, but then you also have, you know, key figures like, you know, Patricia Walden, one of the key disciples of Iyengar, who is a, a luminary in yoga within the United States, or people like Shiva Ray, you know, who had practiced the Shtanga Vinyasa at one point, but then went on to really innovate her own system, rising to the level of, you know, uh, you know, stardom within the yoga community that really indicates that women can and do have authority over their own lineages, their own systems of yoga. And I think as Daniel was suggesting, this is really something unique and distinct from what we see at least within the modern context of yoga in India. Now there is some in coming around on this where in part because of the way that yoga has been transformed in Europe and America, you see some similar transformations happening in India, such as more women practicing yoga um, in public spaces, you know, often still wearing saris, um, but occasionally wearing more sort of Western style yoga apparel. Um, Daniel talked at the end of the book about the pizza effect, which is the idea that, you know, when a practice leaves one world and enters into another, sometimes it's transformed and then its transformed version is re returned then to its original context, much as the way that pizza became, you know, began as a kind of working man's bread or working person's bread in Italy, comes to the United States, is turned into a kind of main course cuisine, but then reappropriated in Italy as a kind of higher Italian cuisine. So similarly with yoga, we see that the way it's been transformed in Europe and America in part has then fed into transformations in India as well. Did I capture a bit of you what did. you were no, saying? No, no, absolutely. No, and no, thank you for that additional context on, on, on Tantra. I suppose I'm always you know, unsure where we draw the line between the world of Tantric practice and ritual and the world of yoga. And there's an enormous overlap and enormous influence, but um, the texts about yoga don't have much space for women is, is the, the, the point I was really trying to make. Mm -hmm. And yet, as you rightly point out, the earliest of the Upanishads, uh, the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad, there's this great scene where Yajna Valkya basically tells his wife how to get enlightened before he disappears to the forest. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's perfectly acceptable that she should get that. A woman nearly beats him in a debate. And then, as you say, obviously in the Mahabharata, there's, there's great stories. And you know, the nun who beats the king and makes him look an idiot tells Janaka he can't be enlightened because he's a dirty, engaged in a dirty business of statecraft um, but yeah it's, it's so, so many stories in there and so many threads but the thread that seems most dominant is that there are lots of men talking about men um, and in the modern era it's changed and thankfully you know it's, it's pendulum has swung the other way and I'm aware we're, we're, we're running 
tight for time, Courtney. Um, yeah. Are there still questions? If so, I don't mind staying on if, 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 if that's okay with you. Um, yeah, I, we can go a little bit. Um, there is one more question. So I figured- Let's just do that one question. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so this question is from Mark and he says, I've done yoga for 49 years in many, many styles and teachers. It seems that the one thing in common is discovering and rediscovering the mind-body interface for whatever I need on that day. So do you feel that like the universal kind of across all practices is that interface between the mind and the body? It's a very interesting question. Um, and I think it cuts to the core of one of the things I was talking about earlier about the sort of distinction between practical advice and scholarship in a way. Um, yeah, both the mind and the body are ultimately in you know, the, the higher goals of yoga to be transcended. Um, and yet, obviously, for day to day purposes, they're both very helpful tools and we wouldn't get very far in life if we didn't pay any attention to them. Um, so I think from a Western perspective, given this yeah, prevailing emphasis on the distinction between the mind and the body that many people sort of trace back to Descartes and the idea that you know, we exist because we think, <laughs> Uh, it's very helpful to remember that there's another ex sort of expression of what's going on in the world that doesn't you know, get processed verbally between the ears. Um, and to become more embodied is a really helpful way of dealing with what the world throws at us. Um, just, 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 just even to be able to, 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 to feel rather than to, to get lost in the mind. Uh, as long as we can feel without at the same time getting you know, more caught up in stories about how we feel. Um, and yoga practice is a really wonderful way of doing that, um, especially physical asana practice. It makes us do uncomfortable things that we try to get more you know, tolerant of for a specified period of time. And, and, and that's, that's training. The mind learns a new, new habit. Um, it learns that it doesn't get to run the show all the time and it can perhaps have the volume turned down on it and, and that something within us you know, is, is, is opened up and a bit more space exists to function. So I think that's, yeah practically speaking for most of us what what day-to-day what -day yoga practice helps with um, it might not be the ultimate goal which is to go beyond all that but you know who, who's going beyond all day long if you've got a job to go to or you know a family to feed <laughs> or tasks to perform um so you know we we, we, we live in the world and, and things have shifted and i sometimes think that the next stage and perhaps even what i might do one day if i finally make good on my promise to myself is to, to try and talk about you know modern householder yoga um, and the seeds of, of that that there are in the past and, uh, and how philosophy in a way gets rearranged if we start to say well I'm not actually aiming for the ultimate goal at all I'm going to say my vision of freedom is to be more functional day to day in society and, and you know, what then becomes the place of yoga in, in, in that bigger picture it's a very interesting question for me at least uh, and uh, I don't know that it's very easy to answer except for, for each of us for ourselves to find our own relationship with it so that's ultimately what yoga is about which goes back to the title of the you know is the truth of yoga to be found in your own experience and um and i think the yogis themselves would probably and yoginis would argue that that's the case that what ultimately matters is that transformation absolutely um, yeah and, and uh, as a practice facilitates and so adapting your practice to suit where you're at at that moment you know would seem right on the mark i couldn't agree more and therefore you know that's that's the that's the truth of yoga that it's it's up to us <laughs> in each moment all there is is each moment um, what else is there all right, guys. Well, thank you so much for this awesome conversation. We really enjoyed hosting this event. Um, thank you, Daniel and Stuart. It's been super fun. Um, and thank you to everyone who came and joined us today. We really appreciate your support. Um, and again, you can find both of these authors' titles on our grassroots website. Thank you so much. Could I just say one last thing before yeah. we go? If, if anybody would like to uh, delve a little bit deeper, I've got an online course, um, which is exploring the ideas in the book in, you know, in a lot more depth that starts in two, three weeks. So if you go to truthofyoga.com, you can find out more about that. It's a chance to uh, immerse yourself in these topics and uh, have you know sort of some live interactive discussion as well. So uh, yeah, I'd love to see some of you there if you, if you feel like it. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Bye. Okay, bye now. Thank you.